<laughs> oh, this is gin. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, I think this is yours. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to Have I Got News For You. I'm Richard Ayuadi. In the news this week, in London, as indoor eating returns, it's feared some diners may have forgotten how restaurants work. Meanwhile, at a nearby table, one couple deny their relationship has become strained during lockdown. <laughs> As overseas travel resumes, one would be holidaymaker who overdid it in lockdown attempts to get beach body ready. <laughs> <laughs> And after another photo op in a warehouse in Bristol, Matt Hancock shows that being an apprentice is so easy, anyone could do it. Ian's team tonight is a politician and member of the House of Lords who was appointed by David Cameron. He texted her earlier to wish her luck, saying, have a good show. P.S. Don't mention me. Please <laughs> help Baroness Vasey. <laughs> and with Paul tonight is a presenter and author who once said, I wish I were cooler, but I'm not. Nice use of the subjunctive, Rich. Hanging tough with the cool guys. <laughs> Please welcome Richard Osman. Right. So, how has your week been, Ian? Oh, uh, no, sorry, we just found out um, we don't care. Um, <laughs> as someone who responds to people, Paul... Yes, I don't care. <laughs> how do you feel about there being an audience here? No, it's great there's an audience. And there's somebody over here with a very distinctive laugh. Um, which is great because, uh, you know, when, when people laugh, it is inspiring. So I, I'm, I'm thrilled and pleased and excited that we have people in front of us again. Okay. <laughs> we begin with the bigger news stories of the week. Ian and Saida, have a look at this. Oh, that's a new variant, Cummings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's got a top secret document from Specsavers. That's the traffic light system for where you can go to travel, and that is everybody going out for a drink because of easing of lockdown. Yeah, no one's told them you can go inside. <laughs> um, this is the exciting news that everything is open except it isn't. Yes, this is the now familiar confusion surrounding the government's COVID advice on travel. Um, what is the government's position on foreign travel? It's a traffic light and it's a new system from the government and uh, there's red, white and blue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and anybody who disagrees with it should probably be shot. Yes. <laughs> yes. Red don't go, amber don't go unless it's an absolute family emergency and green you can go. And I think there's only... Is it Portugal and the Falkland Islands or something on...? That's Green? exactly right. And, but also, if you're an uh, Instagram influencer, you're allowed to go. Oh, yeah. is that right? Yeah. Yes, it is. That, was that one of the exceptions? Yes, because that's a central business. Oh, is that? Yeah. Yes, it is. Oh, my God, so we all need to sign up to being Instagram influencers and then we can go on holiday. Like you're not an Instagram influencer. <laughs> <laughs> OK, is this when I can put my Instagram account out and ask everybody to follow me? I mean, listen, very, <laughs> very best of luck. Go on. <laughs> Don't go abroad, but it's not illegal. That's the position. Lord Bethel... Yeah, James. The fifth and the best baron. Jimmy, yeah. Um, he's... <laughs> no, Jimmy. Jimbo. James. Yeah. The J guy. Yeah. Um, said, don't go abroad at all. Just oh, don't... did he? He Bethel did. Said he that. just said... Yeah. No way. That's frickin' Bethel. Wow. Listen, well, don't well, listen. go, mate. Lord Bethel is, the, is, to me, the same as Mission Impossible, in that the fifth one is surprisingly the best. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
very good. <laughs> um, and the Environment Secretary, George Eustace, said it's OK to travel to amberless countries. Then Boris Johnson and also Matt Hancock contradicted George Eustace and said only go to amber countries for pressing business reasons. <laughs> but they're, they're, you know, there are thousands of tourists that have gone to Portugal on a holiday this week. If the government wants to stop us going somewhere, presumably they should stop us going somewhere. What is the problem? And stop they they stop there. us going to funerals. I mean, they stop us going to care homes. But if you want to go on holiday to a place that's a bit dodgy, fine. What is wrong with them? You know, the, and, and, and this is the point about the red No, what is wrong with them? What is... <laughs> <laughs> How long you got? Um... <laughs> oh, a couple of hours. We'll make time. What is wrong with them? <laughs> I just think they've gone off on a little wander off to the right, and they just need to find their way back into the central space. I think we've sorted it. Yeah, I think yeah. we have. Um, things reached a low point for George Eustace when he was inadvertently dissed on Radio 4, one of the cruelest disses you can get, yes. by MP Peter Bone. Oh, want, that is cruel. Do you want to hear this? Yes, yes. by all means. OK. Uh, George Eustace, I think, um, was also not <laughs> George correct. George Eustace, I think. <laughs> yes. I think you <laughs> might have been uh, a bit of a nickname. It is early yeah. in the morning, at least for me, anyway. <laughs> Solid burn. <laughs> Whoa. Wow. That was not a slip of the tongue. I have heard pump. that before. <gasps> In Tory circles. Stop it. It is unacceptable and, that it and, was done so publicly. And about Jeremy Hunt as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Portugal is very much the destination du jour, uh, or should I say du dia. Um, <laughs> you can meet some lovely people on the plane to Portugal. Who? Is it the remaining members of the Tremolos? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The answer is journalists. Oh. The planes are full of journalists reporting on how everyone's going to Portugal. <laughs> um, or would be if they could get a seat. One person tweeted, convinced that everyone currently on a flight to Portugal is just a journalist there to report on it. Loads of film crews trying to vox pop each other. <laughs> <laughs> is that what they call it? Yeah, like a big <laughs> vox pop circle. That, that's, <laughs> this is exactly like when Special Branch infiltrated an extremist group only to find out that all seven of them were from Special Branch. <laughs> <laughs> group didn't exist. <laughs> Matt Hancock is issuing more advice. What about? I mean, do we care? <laughs> <laughs> Let's pretend. Is he offering advice on hugging? He is. People should hug outdoors and avoid tight clinches. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing too tight, lads. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, <laughs> listen, chance it'd be a fine thing. Yeah, look at this. <laughs> OK. I'd but... be all over him if this wasn't... Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this has got nothing to do with Covid. I insisted upon it. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be climbing you like a tree. He's a, he's a, he's a tiger. He's a yeah, tiger. He'd try and put you inside him. Ex well... Excuse me? <laughs> I mean, like a Russian doll, not... Why is that...? <laughs> Here's Matt Hancock gearing up for a tight one. Yeah. It's been absolutely fantastic being here this morning with Matt Hancock. Ooh, that's really creepy! Matt Hancock. <laughs> Can't keep his eyes off it, can he? Yeah. This man's looking at our personal space. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, what's he like, Cider, as a person, Matt Hancock? Matt Matt is actually quite nice. Is he? Yeah, he is. He, and I think he's genuinely trying his best. So, and how does he feel about being totally out of his depth? <laughs> <laughs> like I said... <laughs> like, like I said, Paul, he's genuinely trying his best. Yes. And as long as people try their best, we're nice to them. Yes. Well, did you never go to nursery? As long as people are doing their best... No, but he went beyond best, nursery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I met people there that are smarter than him. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I honestly think, look, joking aside, he's had a really tough... We're not week. joking. No. <laughs> are you asking us to disregard his competence? <laughs> 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 I, I, I'm, I'm saying he got some things right and he got some things wrong, and this was a pandemic... And he's a hell of a finger painter. Yeah, <laughs> But these days he just says get jabbed, and I think that's quite good. I think it's okay. just nice to have someone telling everyone to get vaccinated. Yes. We can all get behind that as a story. Totally oh, yeah. not. Looks like he can get behind everyone. 
Oh. You're a little bit obsessed tonight, aren't you, Richard? He is so close. Now. Why is he so close to her? It was the old days. People behave like that. It's really weird. I wonder if he was told to get in it. So it's quite a tight shot. The now. shot's so That's wide. Massive. You can see the ambulance in the background. <laughs> David Lean's taking closer shots than this. <laughs> <laughs> That's like quite often if I have my photograph taken with someone shorter than me at a thing and they'll say it was just a headshot so I'll sort of like duck a little bit with my knees and then they'll do the full shot of just me kind of ducking with my knees. Right. <laughs> they've, they've handcocked me is what they've done there. Yeah. I understand that. Absolutely handcocked. Sage member Sir Mark Walport made an interesting philosophical point. Did you see this? No. Great no. philosophy. Point. He said, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. I agree with that. Well, it's hard not to agree with it because <laughs> it's almost so banally self-evident. You can self take evident. that in so many different ways. Yes. Yeah, but if you substitute the idea of, say, murder, yeah. it becomes self-evident, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes. Just saying. And that's the law in it. Can do, shouldn't. Yeah. Shouldn't. That's murder, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Don't do it. Arson the same. Can do, shouldn't. Don't yeah. do it. <laughs> Stuff in an ocelot with Marmite. Same thing. <laughs> Of course, you can do it. Can do it, yeah. Thank you. And you also thank you, but you shouldn't do it. <laughs> Driving up to Barnard Castle for an eye test. Can yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Come on, have I got news for you? Can do. <laughs> shouldn't do it. <laughs> right. The Sunday Telegraph uh, managed mm. to fill some space by asking some young, dynamic <laughs> celebrities who they'd hug first. What did you say to them, Ian? I said I would hug the Prime Minister and hold him there till the bailiffs came. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. According to the Daily Star, mm. who didn't ask you anything no. this week, I'm afraid. It's, it's a rare week off for them. Uh, what needs to happen to save our pubs? People need to go in there and start buying beer, I suppose. Yes. How much, though? Oh, I see. Oh, I saw that. I saw this figure. It was something like um, 60,000 litres or something were going to be per drunk person. in the... <laughs> <laughs> there's going to be a yeah. queue for the toilet, isn't there? <laughs> 60,000 <laughs> litres. Once the parliamentary bar's open, come on, we're going to be on a good roll. It's 124 pints of beer. That's what everyone needs to drink. In what time span? As fast as you can. <laughs> like, a, like a game show? Yeah, just get it down you. OK. Or 122 <laughs> glasses of wine. They're not fussy. OK, cool. That's um, cool. And uh, we each need to spend £382 this year to make up for the shortfall. Everyone. Wow. I tell you what, I'll get a pint and a packet of Tyrrell's crisps. That should do it. <laughs> <laughs> what was the big news in Bristol this week? on this first day of legal indoor hospitality. Did Paul stuff an ocelot with Marmite? <laughs> Marmite, yeah. I, remember something, I remember something happened. That was page six. Yeah. The big news oh. was that a man had a medium fry-up inside the Fountain Cafe. That's right. <laughs> man has fry-up. What kind of maniac orders a medium <laughs> fry-up? <laughs> Who's doing that? A medium. Um, what could spoil our progress to the sunlit uplands? We've mentioned this. Uh, the Indian variant. variant. The Indian variant. The Indian variant. Yeah. That's right. Are you worried? The worst variant was the English variant, which we stopped calling the English... We didn't call it the English variant quite so often, did we? Mm. But that was that, the worst. We narrowed it down. We called the it the Kent, Kent variant. The Kent, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make it clear. What can we get away with? Let's say, let's say Kent. Kent. Yeah, yeah, our county. Yeah. Stick it there. Yeah. <laughs> but the Germans referred to it as the English virus all the way through. Yeah, there's been a bit of history between the two countries, hasn't Is there? that right? <laughs> We used to do that with measles, didn't we? We named that after them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> German measles, yeah. Cool. Spanish flu. Yeah. 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 We're yeah. very keen to plant it elsewhere. Yeah. Hitler mumps. <laughs> <laughs> I was inoculated against them as a kid. Yeah. yeah. You have to put your arm up like that to begin. <laughs> <laughs> We're allowed because we won. We were allowed to say that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, just because you're allowed to say it doesn't mean you have to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he has been threatening to reveal all. Dominic Cummings. Boris News, Dominic Cummings, yes, yes. he's been browdering on his blog about how the government should have come clean about what was happening in the early weeks of the pandemic. Why didn't he speak up? Listen, this is the story that <laughs> Dominic Cummings is going to reveal some top-secret documents and information about how, when he was doing the job he was supposed to be doing, he did it pretty badly. And he's going to tell everybody this about is news? how... This is news? Oh, exactly. And he's going <laughs> to tell everybody how it wasn't him, it was Boris. OK. It's so great you know. to have him back, isn't it? It's like, it's like, like a baddie from season three of a, of a drama. <laughs> you think, oh, I've forgotten him. 
He's coming back, how lovely. And, you know, his lines this time back are fantastic. He says, you know, what the government really should have had is more openness and transparency. <laughs> <laughs> this is a man who was dragged to a press conference who said nothing about his whole escapade up to Barnard Castle and then told a load of lies in front of the press. But now, openness is what we need. Transparency. Yes. And also, he says, I've got this secret document. I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> <laughs> not that open. And I'm going to put it on eBay. Wow. I mean, he's, he, he really is the, the kind of prince of dark arts, isn't he? He's, he's our very own, or was when he was at the heart of government, you know, our very own little finger, the kind of bastard of Bannard Castle. He really <laughs> knew how to kind of make sure he had all the power in his hands. And so, um, so likeable. And exactly. <laughs> and I just think that everybody is just desperate to have him back to tell us exactly, you know, what he wasn't doing when he should have been doing his job. So, to make it clear, you are still standing by him. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This is kind of... This is ultimate conservative loyalty that's on display. The serious story really is we have to be prepared to hold our own government, and if that means that's my, you know, my own party, to account. Yeah. I, I like the idea this is a clash... I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I always forget politicians need the clap at the, at, <laughs> at the end. Applause is a better word in that context. <laughs> <laughs> Not with this Prime Minister. Oh, <laughs> oh really? <laughs> One of the big issues at the start of the pandemic was PPE supplies. What have we learnt about that this week? This really incenses me, actually. Um, two contracts were given out uh, to companies that had never supplied PPE before. Uh, more stories are emerging about how some lucrative PPE contracts were dished out. Uh, Matt Hancock was lobbied by former Conservative MP Brooks Newmark. There he is who had joined forces with a pet food company, of course, to broker PPE deals for international suppliers. Brooks Newmark is probably best known for being tempted by an undercover journalist to expose his penis in a sting operation, which, that is painful. Yeah. yeah. Think, uh, that is very painful. Um, and listen, I'm with you guys. I'm the first one. In fact, last year, I was tabling questions on this and, you know, I was being battered down by my, uh, by my own colleagues by saying, this is wrong. I sm you know, this, people smell a rat here. There's, there's something that's gone on that needs to be exposed and we need to have an independent inquiry. And I'm completely with the rest of you on this. We need to catch the rat. And fortunately, a friend of mine has a rat-catching company. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> The £200 million pounds the job is his. For <laughs> <laughs> a rat. Yeah, of course. <laughs> He'll even supply his own rats, will he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the news that people were finally allowed to go on holiday. Yeah. Home Secretary Priti Patel has warned that people who visit countries they've been advised not to go to can expect a knock on the door, adding, although when I went to Israel without permission in 2017, I just got a phone call telling me I was sacked. <laughs> Despite the easing of COVID <laughs> restrictions, I'm still not able to hug my friends due to an underlying condition. Misanthropy. <laughs> Paul and Richard take a look at this. Yeah. There we are. That's how to grow a plant in the middle of a carpet. <laughs> and uh, I don't know who he's got under there. But... Uh, <laughs> she's pleased about it. Wooden elephants. Uh, we've got to save wooden elephants. There's very few of them left. Yeah. And, you know, wooden elephants don't grow on trees. <laughs> <laughs> Although, although they do have trunks. Yes, indeed, there we are. <laughs> um, Prince Charles, I think, has suggested, which is actually a rather good idea for the Queen's Jubilee, yes. that we're gonna, everyone should plant a tree. Which um, Jubilee? Do you know? Yes. It, do you know what? When I was at school, I, I remember at primary school, it was her 25th, it was a silver Jubilee, 25th year, and we got a little, little silver coin. Mm. And now it's her 70th. And yes. I briefly panicked and thought I was 95. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's the Platinum Jubilee. Which she got for selling a million copies of her last album. Yes. <laughs> yes, well, in 2022, the Queen will have been on the throne for 70 years, which Prince Charles intends to uh, mark by launching what? Well, it's plant a tree. Is that what you were suggesting, wasn't it? Yeah. Let's take a look. As we approach this most special year, I invite you all to join me to plant a tree for the Jubilee. In other words, a tree belie. <laughs> Look, yeah. he is pretty pleased with that, yeah. isn't he? I think it's quite a good idea, isn't it? It's quite hard, yeah. it's a rather mm. nice thing to do. More woodland. Three million saplings he's looking for. Lovely. Good he's already planted one. Hmm? 
the Queen was with Charles for the tree planting. Um, after almost 70 years on the throne, her curiosity is undimmed. Did that come out of the hole? <laughs> I'd love it if that was the first scene of the next series of Line of Duty. Yeah. <laughs> Did that come out of the hole is a very good opening line. <laughs> yeah, and well. who is H? Yes. <laughs> Living in California. Yeah. <laughs> We know what Prince Charles is planning to do for the Jubilee. What's Prince Andrew planning to do? That's the... Uh, <laughs> oh, he'll be getting sheriff. pizzas in, won't he? <laughs> <laughs> doing that. What's the latest bad news for Prince Andrew? Oh, he's been stripped of some more charities. Yes, he has been removed as patron by nearly 50 organisations um, over his links with dead paedophile Jeffrey Epstein. Um, although, according to the Sunday Telegraph, a few felt unable to completely sever ties, um, as he hasn't been charged or convicted of any crime. Instead of formally parting ways, they removed his portrait from the wall, deleted his name from their website, and in one case, concealed a plaque bearing his name <laughs> behind the plant. That's what all these trees are for when we plant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the tree belief is such good news for Prince Andrew. <laughs> Keep him planting. Meanwhile, what has the Queen's cousin, Prince Michael, been caught doing? Oh, it's something to do with Russia, isn't it? Yes, he's been caught in the Channel 4 sting. Apparently offering access to Putin for money, he also offered to endorse what he thought was a South Korean company appearing in a promotional video for them for just £200,000. What else does Prince Michael do for money? Is it fuck all? <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's one of the things I forgot down here. I'll definitely give you that. That's I'd... Prince Andrew, surely. <laughs> no, I think he fucks all. Uh... <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> he also endorses dog food, specifically a dog food called The Rockster. On their website, he says, I believe Rockster is a remarkable superfood for dogs and would not hesitate in recommending it to other owners. <laughs> Meanwhile, what wasn't put out on Monday? What wasn't put out? Oh, my God, my recycling. Yes. <laughs> Is this Panorama? Yes, it is Panorama. Oh, yes. It was right. a BBC programme about the Princess Diana interview. Yes. And whether Martin Bashir at the time had fake documents and conned her into it. That's right. But the programme was pulled after the BBC said they had a significant duty of care issue. On Thursday, what did the Dyson Inquiry have to say about how former BBC Director General Tony Hall handled the matter at the time? They're very critical and said it was a cover-up. It said that the investigation was woefully ineffective. And the only person who was punished was the, the graphic designer. So he got thrown under a bus and it's taken 25 years for the rest of them to um, admit that, yep. yes, actually, they did fake it as well. Wow. This yeah. isn't Dyson the vacuum man. No. This is another Dyson. Lord, another Dyson. Dyson. Lord Dyson. Is he Baron Dyson? This is the Dustbuster one. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the Dustbuster one. I'm just having fun. Um, <laughs> anyway, he's not sweeping this one under the carpet. Good, <laughs> <laughs> that. Oh, oh, come on. <laughs> it said that the BBC had covered up Martin Bashir's deceitful tactics. While well, Martin Bashir said, it is an action I deeply regret. He's been off on sick leave and on Friday he resigned as the BBC's religion editor on health grounds. The panorama was pulled from the schedule the following Monday. Uh, finally, see if you can spot the shadowy figure behind US Interior Secretary Deb Haaland. Let's take a look. Seth, considering the fact that I was sworn in by the very first woman vice president, also a woman of color, uh, that was... That was <laughs> the best I'm sorry, Secretary, I'm going to interrupt you real quick. You have a staffer who fully crawled on the carpet behind you. <laughs> and it is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Sir? <laughs> Sir, we know you're behind the desk. OK. Um, I would love to pretend. Thank you very much. <laughs> For a moment, I thought that was Donald Trump returning to the Oval Office. <laughs> he never left. Yeah. At the end of that round, it's two points each. Yes. And so to round two, the hotspot of news. Hotspot of news? Oh. That's right. Fingers on buzzers. Right. Buzz when you know where it is. Here's the map. Where is that? Great Britain. <laughs> Scotland. It is Scotland, but I need even more specific than wow. Scotland. Is it Glasgow? It is. What's going on in Glasgow? 
Well, somebody's had a biscuit in Glasgow and, and such has oh, been the lack of news this week. Uh, it's mm. made headlines. It's a biscuit factory in yeah. Glasgow, McVitie's, yes. and no longer making... Chocolate hobnobs. And that's probably right. Is that right? They're on the verge of closure. I, please tell me they're still making chocolate hobnobs, though. Is it all biscuits they're, they're going to... They're worried. They're very worried about closure. Why are they considering closure? Well, people aren't eating as many biscuits as they used to. That's right. Bosses are describing the UK's biscuit market as mature. <laughs> the problem is that people who buy biscuits are getting old and soon there'll be nobody left to buy biscuits. <laughs> That's a problem. Um, despite a rise in sale of biscuits during the pandemic, there's been a decline in biscuit eating. What? Since no. People are just storing these biscuits. Yeah. <laughs> They're hoarding them, they don't know what to do with them, people have forgotten how to use their mouths. Yeah. According to the Office of National Statistics, yeah. the average person ate 214 grams of biscuits per week in 1974, but only 159 grams in 2019. And nothing in between. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So weird. What's your favourite biscuit, Richard? Well, this is going to be very controversial. No, go on. Uh, Jaffa cake. OK. It's not a biscuit. Which people say is not a biscuit, but of course it is. <laughs> That's why it's called Jaffa cake. Well, listen, it's called a cake, for sure, yeah. but... What do you mean, you know, for sure? What's it short for? Biscuit. But Bonnie Tyler is called Tyler, but I wouldn't let her grab my bathroom. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I, 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 well, you know what? To be fair, I would. No, I would, too. But Jaffa cakes are in the biscuit aisle. If you, if you had a kid's birthday party... I'm sometimes in the biscuit aisle. Doesn't make me a biscuit. Yeah. <laughs> Although you're, you're, saying? Are, you're a little bit of a biscuit. <laughs> what are your favourites? No-one asked you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Finally. It's, it's the Megan question. How are you? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a lot of people on the inside have not asked me that, actually. It's ginger nut. <laughs> Thank you. Now, a recent poll of Britain's favourite biscuits in Sunday Times, of course, put the chocolate digestive in second place. First was the Kit Kat. Mm. But even more worryingly, and we will discuss this, in 10th place is the Ribita crisp bread. Oh. <laughs> Bit drop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> drop. Unbelievable. Imagine... That's a building material. <laughs> 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 um, also this week, and I feel we've dealt with it, somewhere uh, where they probably still enjoy biscuits, that is the link, Ashworth <laughs> Grange Care Home in West Yorkshire. Uh, residents there have become the new stars of TikTok. Uh, what have they been getting up to? Are these the new masters of drill? <laughs> there's there's two very old blokes in a, in a retirement home who've, 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 who've taken the UK drill scene by storm. The UK drill scene? Yeah. Talk us through drill music, Ian. Drill, it's a sort of uh, hybrid of gangster rap and grime and it's become very big <laughs> among... Um, <laughs> I'll tell you what they've been getting up to. Not, not drill music, yep. specifically. They've been posting videos of themselves dancing to keep busy during the pandemic, uh, mm. which have racked up millions of views um, in the past two weeks. Here's Colin doing some Sean Paul. The girl them skill our chick. Stand up, pal. Some give it to, some give it to, some give it to, to our girls. Five million and forty naughty shorty. Baby girl, I'm a girl, I'm a girl. Stand up, pal. Say. She won't stop banging those parts next to his head. <laughs> this is the news that the McVissie's factory in Glasgow could be closing. The head of McVissie's is putting a brave face on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Scott of the Antarctic took British biscuits with him on his ill-fated expedition to the South Pole, notably the two-fingered Kit Kat. It was originally five fingers. <laughs> Also, this week, residents of a West Yorkshire care home went viral for their TikTok videos. One of the songs the residents enjoy lip-syncing to is Dolly Parton's Nine to Five, or, as the residents call it, bedtime. <laughs> Back to the hot spot of news, fingers on buzzers, teams. Where's this? Yes. Is that Canterbury? Or is it London? It's more specifically South London. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what's been going on in South London? Well, there's a packet of uh, hula hoops has just appeared on screen. Oh, they're not closing the hula hoops. <laughs> <laughs> what this is, is that a man in Peckham... Yes. ..South London... Yes. ..has found a huge hula hoop. No. I'm talking a really big one. 
Um, I'm not going to ask if you want to see it, because you do want to see yeah, it. Yeah, we do. Yeah. We do. yeah. <laughs> That's right. Whoa. That did Thank not you. disappoint. Yes. <laughs> I, I think uh, yeah. somebody in the factory's been having some fun there, haven't they? <laughs> Here's Rowan holding the snack for scale. <laughs> wow. That's right. Yeah, but we don't know how tall he is. Yeah. His... <laughs> so what's the scale? He's 30 centimetres. Oh, right, OK. Yeah. Seamless segue alert. Yeah. Hole-based snacks to holes in the ground in Siberia. Who are these people? What are they doing? What are they competing for? They look like they're digging graves. That's exactly what they're doing. Wow. At the annual grave digging contest in... <laughs> Nova Sibar oh, I don't know how to say this. In Nova Sibarsk? Sibirsk. Sibirsk. Nova Sibirsk. Mm. You've been there. Yeah. You've competed. The yeah. drill scene there is unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know why they do this? There's no Wi-Fi reception? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's, that's one of the reasons. The reasons are threefold. To raise the prestige of the profession improve gravedigger's work performance and attract younger generations <laughs> to careers in the funeral industry. Wow. Is it televised? I'm hosting it. Things <laughs> <laughs> on Buzz's teams. Where's this? Yes. Is that Liverpool? It is Liverpool. What's yes. happening in Liverpool? Well, there's a man there in a the supermarket. He's bought every single variety of powdered soup that's available in the market, or pot noodles, over the last four or five years, and he's claimed a world record for it. It's not what? that. <laughs> it's not that. Oh. This is the excellent news. Yes. That shopping trolleys in Liverpool will be fitted with sensors that will tell you if you're about to die. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to know why they've done this? Um, uh, yeah, I think we do, actually. OK. Researchers from Liverpool John Moores University, yeah. good people, are putting sensors in the handles of shopping trolleys at Sainsbury's which can detect irregular heartbeats in order to identify people most at risk of a stroke. What shops would you most like to find out you've got a serious illness in? <laughs> <laughs> Boots. Yes. <laughs> Ian? Probably in the hospital flower shop. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice and near. Some very nice and cautious answers coming here. <laughs> Whilst the Liverpool John Moores University has been busy with shopping trolleys, what have researchers from University College London been up to? Something even more important. Have they been working out if people have got head lice by giving them carrier bags? <laughs> <laughs> yes. But they've also been examining whether or not our brains can cope with extra body parts. <laughs> and the good news is... they can. Wow. wow. They, they really can. What, what, like what an extra part? leg or something, or...? Not far off. Get more specific. Extra head? Smaller. A finger. Hand. Extra finger. Finger. That was the weirdest auction I've ever been in. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's a third thumb. According to Paulina Kyleba, who led the study, the brain was able to adapt to control the extra digit, which was operated by the toe. Here it is in action. What would you do with an extra thumb? Extra body parts can extend and augment human capabilities. But while augmentative technology is progressing rapidly, we're still lacking answers to some fundamental questions. We also encouraged them to take it home and use it as they liked. But we also found that people changed their natural hand movements, which may impact how the brain represents their hands. <laughs> there is a lot of interest in people being given extra arms and extra fingers. In Japan, they have a robotic tail that you can attach to your body. <laughs> That's the reason. Because the Japanese have developed a robotic tail. <laughs> and we need to catch up and peel bananas one-handed. <laughs> right? It's, gonna, it's currently a fingers race. It's going to turn into an arms race. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that was worth the price of free admission, did not it? <laughs> <laughs> this is the great news that shopping trolleys in Liverpool will be fitted with sensors that tell you if you're about to die. Also this week, Researchers have discovered our brains can adapt to having an additional digit. The third thumb device has improved hitchhiking efficiency by 33%. <laughs> <laughs> which means at the end of this round, it's Ian and Saida with four, and Paul and Richard with four. Mm. <laughs> Brilliant. Good job. <laughs> Time now for the odd one out round. Uh, just one between you this week. Your four are the River Nen, Mount Everest, Don Quixote and supermarket chain Aldi. There's been a dispute about what they're called. There's been a story that the river, which is called Nen, I think, by one county, and Neen by another county, 
And so they had a game of croquet, I think, to try and decide what the answer was. You're completely right. They've all been mispronounced apart from the River Nen, which has officially settled the pronunciation of its name with a croquet match. I got in trouble for calling it the River Neen on point this once. I know that people are very up on pronunciation. How much trouble did you get into? Oh, you wouldn't believe it. It was I was prison. in prison for seven or eight years. <laughs> <laughs> which is a bit much. I was in Belmarsh and everyone's like, what are you in for? And I was like, mispronunciation of the river yeah. Nen. And they, went, they were like, same, same. <laughs> <laughs> and after seven years, you found out it was pronounced Belmarche. <laughs> <laughs> Two croquet teams decided to go to war, and it was a war. It was a brutal war. Wow. Because the people of Peterborough, they call the river the Neen. Yeah. And uh, the people of Northampton call it the Nen. Oh, mate. You can see why it got real fast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Northampton croquet team trounced their rival Peterborough 7 2 in the nine game contest. The river must now officially be called the Nen in all croquet correspondence. Wow. Here's a key moment from one of the big croquet games. Mm. <laughs> As you can see, happily COVID has had no effect on the side of the crowds. <laughs> There's loads of countries I used to mispronounce on point this time. Kiribati, which is Kiribati, apparently. And yeah. Everest, supposedly, is called Everest. E yes. But they called it Everest. Yes, you're right. In fact, George Everest was rather embarrassed that his name had been used as he had no direct connection with the mountain and never saw it in person. But he surveyed it. No, he was a surveyor. Um, but just not of that. He just did yards. <laughs> and jobs, stuff he, like that. He, he saw it once on Google Maps. Yeah. yeah. And that was it. He just came round and said, I don't think you're going to get damp, and then charged you £2,000. <laughs> <laughs> How do people tend to mispronounce Don Quixote? Don, Don Quixote. That's right. According to a survey of 2,000 people, 44% of readers pronounce the knight's name as Don Quixote instead of Don Quixote. <laughs> How do you pronounce Aldi currently? I think Ian pronounces it Waitrose, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> According to Germans, Britons have been saying the budget German supermarket name wrong and the Al in Aldi should be short and sharp, like Al Murray. It's frequently mispronounced Aldi by British shoppers. Wow. Yeah. Which mispronunciations yeah. yank your chain? Yeah, I hate the way people see the words Boris Johnson and say Prime Minister. Oh. <laughs> Finally, yes. what deliberate misspelling of Keir have Keir Starmer opponents taken to calling him online? I, is it like Keith? It is. It's exactly... It's not like I Keith. I saw it, it but Keith. I don't know, but I didn't understand it's what exactly the uh, Keith. point of it was. I would have gone for Kiora. <laughs> <laughs> Keir Starmer meets Rita Ora. Yes. And Kiora. give it time. <laughs> <laughs> they would make a lovely power couple, wouldn't they? They certainly mm. would, wouldn't they? Keir Starmer and Rita Ora. Yeah. Keith He'd have Ora. to take her name, though, wouldn't he? Yeah, well, that's but, right. I, but yeah, I think he probably would. Yeah. It's a modern gesture. Yeah, exactly. Rita Starmer, so she's suddenly in Coronation Street. But... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, many to the political left of Keir have been trying to rile Starmer's supporters by calling him Keith, and there are a few theories surrounding this as to why they're doing it, one of them being that the name Keith itself is actually just very boring. I mean, Keith Richards. I mean, what are they talking about? Yeah. One Labour left-winger said, Keith has come to epitomise Starmer's beige banality, a man with all the charm of the pub bore who'd find himself outperformed by a talking potato sack. Um, which is, I think, a bit mean. Some of us can be quite charming. <laughs> They're all frequently mispronounced, apart from the river Nen, which has officially settled the pronunciation of its name with a vicious croquet match. The pronunciation of the river is still hotly contested. In Northampton, they say Nen. In Peterborough, they say Neen. And in the rest of Britain, we say, no one cares. <laughs> To climb Everest, you need meticulous planning, protective equipment, and an official certificate of good health. So currently, it's easier to get to the summit of Everest than have a week in Corfu. <laughs> uh, which means at the end of this round, it's Ian and Saida with six, Paul and Richard with four. Mm. Oh. Uh, it. It. <laughs> Time now for the missing words round, which this week features as its guest publication Norfolk Nips. No, not that one. <laughs> Although it is good. It's the magazine <laughs> of the Norfolk branches of real ale drinkers. And we start with significant events of 1989 included the fall of the Berlin Wall, the first satellite TV broadcast, and what? Opening the first real ale pub in Cromer. You're very close. It's Stephen becoming manager at the Litchfield Arms. Oh, yes. yes! Of course. This is from a regular feature in Norfolk, and it's not that one, called <laughs> Interview with the Landlord. 
What did he say? The usual. Next. <laughs> Jane Austen's favourite what was what? Is it Jane Austen's favourite chief medical officer was Chris Whitty? <laughs> yes. Is it position was cowgirl? <laughs> it's snack and snack. cheese toasty. Cheese Her favourite toast. snack was a cheese toasty. I knew toasty. it was that. <laughs> yes, a recipe book has been found containing some of Jane Austen's favourite dishes, which include Jean Mange and fricassee turnips. The Ooh. editor of Martha Lloyd's recipe book said, I thought about Martha living in the cottage with Jane Austen. Those were Jane's most productive years. Can you imagine those conversations? Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, I can. Belt up, Jane. I'm trying to fricassee some turnips here. <laughs> <laughs> fricassee turnips is my drill name. Yes. <laughs> That's Ian's safe word. <laughs> 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 Next, people hate to be called what more than any other pet name. Is it Matt Hancock? <laughs> The answer is sausage. Oh. Uh, to call someone sausage is actually a compliment. It means that no one truly knows what's going on inside you. <laughs> <laughs> Next, poll reveals 71% of men confident they could what? Nothing, that's it. They could. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it confident they could take the other 29% in a fight? <laughs> <laughs> well, the answer, of course, is beat a goose in a fight. <laughs> um, next. Leeds man finds what in his tomato soup? Atlantis. <laughs> Leeds man finds Mona Lisa in his tomato soup. Edvard Munch's The Scream. Matthew Richardson found what he believes to be a spitting image of Edvard Munch's famous painting in his tomato soup. Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's E.T. Next, creator of Orville the Duck confesses to what? Other crimes against humanity. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yeah. nearly killing David Jason with a giant sugar lump. Oh. <laughs> Peter Pullon, the creator of Orville the Duck, revealed uh, this week that he was responsible for throwing a giant sugar lump at actor David Jason in a PG Tips TV commercial in the 1970s that came close to knocking the actor out. Coincidentally, being killed by a giant prop sugar lump was also the original ending for the last series of Line of Duty. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Mr. Watt unveiled as new character for Mr. Men's 50th anniversary. Inappropriate behaviour in the workplace. You're very close. <laughs> Mr. Calm. Yes. Mr. Mr. Calm. And another one, there was Miss. Um... Saigon. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Little misogynist. She was good. <laughs> Mr. Calm is the new character. <laughs> it's good timing since everyone stopped working with Mr. Tickle and he's had to have his bath to taken away. <laughs> <laughs> so the final scores are in Saida Ham, oh. seven, Paul and Richard, six. Mm, well done. And I leave you with news that in South London there are suspicions that someone is tampering with the oxygen supply to Dominic Cummings' underground lair. <laughs> <laughs> As international travel restrictions ease, one Falkland Island family makes the most of the opportunity to visit the UK. <laughs> <laughs> and in Liverpool, the government have responded to criticism cutting arts funding during the pandemic by opening a brand new art centre in Merseyside. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. <laughs>